Places and games aren't connected. When a game asks for you to travel from planet to planet, it's the most cut and dry example of them not being connected. And even with just areas that have loading screens, they're literally disconnected from other parts of the game. Not like your bullets will hit anyone on the other side of that black void, you're in a different world now. As far as the game is concerned, you aren't just on another planet in that cave, you're in a different dimension. So it's respectable when open world games try to keep everything on the same world. No loading screens, no disappearing or respawning enemies, no despawning items on the ground, no disconnection between different areas. I hate to sound like I only play battle royales, but with them, it's probably the best I've seen. The maps are well connected, can be crossed in a single game session without the need of teleports or high speed vehicles and they manage to load and keep track of items looted and dropped on the ground for dozens of players. Though, since they're just good looking fighting arenas, they aren't very big and they don't have much to explore. One is the amusement park world. A complaint we hear about open world games all the time, and it's not incorrect. There are a few games out there that feel pretty immersive as a good open world game, but at the same time, if you look at them a little too close, then it's really easy for the illusion to get shattered. An easy reason a recent example is GTA San Andreas. With the remaster, you can climb on top of Mount Chiliad and see the entire map from the game now. And from that height, it really makes it look like a little model floating in a bathtub. Great at being connected, terrible at being big. The bigger and more detailed maps, though, obviously aren't easy to explore. Once you've, say, explored a corner of the map, getting to another corner is an annoying task in any game map like Skyrim's. So we introduce fast travel. Sometimes diegetically, sometimes not. Though, like with entering another planet, there has to be some disconnection from where you are and where you immediately end up at. Even though you were right next to him before, now you can't hit him with a bullet because he's 20 miles away. Like how you can't shoot at a guy 20 light years away, or you can't shoot at a guy in another dimension. Every place in the game is connected, but also not, because some sections are reachable without any disconnect, but unrealistic to do so. In the end game, or with a large enough map size, every place in the game is reached almost exclusively through fast travel, even if they can be reached normally, so why not go a step further and make it exclusively reachable from fast travel? We're at the point in gaming where we want maps so big they rival planets. We want No Man's Sky, Borderlands 3, The Outer Worlds, The Outer Wilds, and Starfield. We want them because what's better than Skyrim's one map in game is 30 planet-sized Skyrims in the same game. We sacrifice connectedness between areas, but each area is a planet. If we're being honest though, the whole planet title seems like an excuse for their limitations we have. The planets are tiny, like an Outer Wilds or No Man's Sky, because making even one planet-sized planet, let alone multiple, would be too big to make and to explore. Though, because they aren't very big, they match what we already have with cities separated by distance, now they're just separated by space and called planets. Outer Worlds and Borderlands 3 only let you play in certain areas too, so it might as well be cities, just now instead of having two ways of getting to the city, you can only fast travel and sit through a loading screen. And the in-game reason for it is that they're planets in space. No Man's Sky too randomly generates parts of the planet, or the entire planet, with only a few handcrafted locations. No Man's Sky, the way everything is created, is this term that we use, procedural, right? And we're like really picky about that we we say it's not random right because random to me is this like chaotic kind of mess potentially but procedural is like creating mathematical formulas right and they create a result and a, the result is something that's um that's like generated on the fly by the computer but it's a result that hopefully looks correct looks almost like it's been built by hand So I will make a rule that say there should be little flowers around the base of a tree, right? And I'll think that's a good rule. And then I like propagate that to the main branch and suddenly there are flowers around the base of every tree on like every planet, right? And that's cool, um, except it has like horrible knock-ons, crazy ravines and everything just works, you know? Fish will just inhabit these, ships will just land at buildings that automatically get placed. 
This essentially creates a few points of interest, but instead of empty space or unreachable areas surrounding it, it's fully explorable but randomly generated terrain and fauna. Starfield promises fully explorable planets too, but most of it is said to be randomly generated, and even then, the planets are supposedly 5% of the size they should be. So out of a desire for larger maps, we have more small maps which function like big cities, but are called planets and aren't connected. Larger maps might mean a single huge map, or a dense, medium, or small map, but all would require a lot of handcrafted and polished work, and it might lag. A map made from the ground up is difficult, and a map made by making building blocks and then connecting them is difficult. But hypothetically, say we made just the building blocks and randomly generated terrain around each block. We could, in effect, split up a single, medium, or large map created from connected blocks into several small maps and call them planets. These building block planets would be just building blocks, cities, or any points of interest with terrain around them. Anything around the building blocks can be made artificially unique too, since as planets they can both stay separate and have strange alien terrain and fauna, instead of what normally has to fit one game map. Taking this further, building blocks don't have to be detailed or deep, since when there's 600 planets, world building can be turned into ash and replaced with weird architecture and abandoned things, which are small handcrafted fractions of a single building block, but now have randomly generated terrain and are called planets. Now, a lot of terrain and fauna in any game is computer generated and then tweaked. However, it uses some very good procedural tools where the artists can literally just paint a world exactly as they believe it to be. Here's forest. You can start by clearing out an area uh, by painting as a biome like grass, then uh, laying down a road spline. So uh, the trees are cleared out of the road here. And uh, of course, um, we, uh, there will still be some asset that will be, uh, need to be placed by hand, uh, like house, shed, and vehicle here. Uh, yeah, the level artists are not out of work yet. Sometimes even the handcrafted parts in architecture are placed onto the world randomly with a computer, and with entirely randomly generated games, they tweak the generation to produce realistic or at least good-looking terrain and fauna whilst making the graphics for the fauna themselves. Um, and we hired him, and the designers of, sport, of the Spore Creature Creator sat down with him, and over the course of many, many, many hours, carefully talked to him about, so if you're designing a creature, what do you do? Um, and they, you know, they didn't take any answer at face value. They asked him to dig further and further into it, where he ended up talking about like how he draws a bean shape, uh, and that kind of sets the character of the, the creature. And then he hangs a mouth on it, and that sets kind of the, the way that the creature is looking. We ended up implementing all this in Spore, and the Spore creature creator was notoriously really, really good. And I think that was because they asked an expert. Other tile-based generative games like Civ, we forget often that tile-based maps are, are pretty common. Uh, what tiles work well for, so tiles are you have a chunk of, like you have a number of chunks of things and you can then like socket them together uh, to form a map. So you can imagine kind of like the settlers of a Catan board. Nearly all game worlds as time has gone on have handcrafted points of interest with areas in between being supported with computers. To see how that looks with a single planet, there's already a game with an entire full-sized, fully explorable, accurate planet with realistic, good-looking locations made with a computer. Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's a whole, accurately sized world, but they made everything by taking satellite images, which you can't do the same for if it's a fake world that doesn't exist yet, and then letting a computer extrapolate the world surface from those images. One, could you store the entire globe? Well, yes, Bing Maps has aerial photography of the whole planet. That's technology that's pretty commonplace these days. But most of that data is flat photography with some terrain height mapping, and flying over that would just look like traversing a painting of the Earth. That looks terrible, so for any place that they want to look good, they take extra shots of it from the satellite. To make a realistic planet, you're going to have to fill that in with 3D detail. Buildings, trees, roads, and more. Some larger cities have photogrammetry available. Extra shots of it from the satellite, and then handcraft some certain parts of it to look good in the game. Down to the taxiways. 
80 of the most popular and busy airports were given a more handcrafted feel with unique architecture and added detail, with 40 more of these being given the finest level of attention with near perfect representation in the game, though how many of these you have access to depends on which tier of the game you buy. Many points of interest such as famous landmarks and buildings were handcrafted too. Even then though, the game is meant to be played from a plane, and getting too close to even the handcrafted parts, you notice the lack of detail, even from a plane. The game isn't very detailed even in these handcrafted areas, and why? Well, the game is 150 gigabytes, even with all these limitations, so imagine if it looked like a AAA game. It'd be terabytes and it wouldn't run Project well. It's like, hey, the entire planet and every house. 1.5 billion houses and 2 trillion trees in a product. Uh, and it's enabled by the cloud and it's enabled by the Microsoft tech stack. You, you could do uh, AI in your local machine, but you can't process the planet on your local machine. You need 10,000 computers, that's why. Um, only, only something like Azure can do this. The entire game has terrible graphics, so if played like Skyrim, first person and on the ground, it would look worse than Daggerfall and even be untraversable. You can't traverse it. You can't get around the whole map on foot because it's Earth. It's a planet. Places in games aren't connected, but places on planets are? They're not, it's physically impossible to reach some parts of the planet without help from a vehicle, and it's difficult to travel very far without help from a vehicle. So walking, like in The Witcher, would be both impossible and impractical. Parts of the planet that are walkable to are unplayable when there's a significant language or cultural difference, and perhaps might be walkable but have heavy restriction on entering. Even in small cities, parts of it are unreachable without jurisdiction or good reason like government agencies and industrial buildings that don't allow access or how you probably don't want to go to the middle of nowhere or inside an industrial building. Why would you want to? So even in reality, with real connected planets, there's a good reason that most of it isn't there. So these game maps with a lot of cut off and inaccessible areas aren't inaccurate to what we expect in reality. The problem is we don't want reality, we don't want game maps where half of it is technically there but it's just farmland and industry or desert and wilderness. We don't want game maps where you can go to another country, you just can't speak to anyone, and in the places where you can speak to people, everything's overpriced. Game maps where you're limited to what's in walking distance from your spawn point, or game maps where you're pretty much hugging roads even if you don't have a car, which combined to mean you can't reach Vegas for at least a month if you spawn in Albuquerque. Saying all this to say that reality maps are only similar to game maps in name, and that game maps have different requirements to a real map. Real maps showcase everything, even the lame parts, and reality isn't perfect. The perfect game map would be both big and densely packed with interesting things to find, and where somehow everything is easily accessible, and where even the uninteresting and the weird like barren wastelands, flaming sinkholes, and cars clipping into the ground look at home. So what maps fit those criteria? Well, no game's perfect, but I've liked every map layout in Borderlands except for 3, and that wasn't due to bad design in 3, but rather that none of the maps were connected, and literally one of 3's planets had only one map. For a good space Borderlands game, I loved the pre-sequel, and it gave me my favorite Borderlands experience out of the 5 games I've played. First of all, they actually had different gravities for different areas, so like, what other game has that? S several Well, I definitely didn't see anything like that in Destiny 2 or Borderlands 3. Second, the maps are good because they actually connect. In the base game, the pre-sequel has 25 locations over 2 worlds, compared to the 29 locations over 4 planets in Borderlands 3, which, using simple deduction rather than trying to explain what makes them better connected, means that worlds in the pre-sequel are denser than planets in Borderlands 3. The pre-sequel having a little more than 12 locations per world, and Borderlands 3 having about 7 locations per planet. Another good game map would be Hollow Knight, whose map was really fun. 
unrelated, I like games that have overworlds, overworld maps. So like Yakuza 0, Hyperlight Drifter, Moonlighter, the castle in Mario 64, San Andreas functions like an overworld. I believe the Persona games have overworlds, but I couldn't really speak on that. I think it's a great way to keep things connected and in the same world, even sometimes when they are separate levels. When they are separate levels, it could feel weird to say that they're connected, but they're connected in spirit, kinda like the map in Omori. It's been a while, but I thought it had a pretty well-connected map, even if it might have been more linear than sprawling. Minecraft's worlds are entirely randomly generated, sure, but that takes away any expectation of depth, so I really just appreciate how everything built and friendly mobs stay the same, while even items don't despawn if outside the render distance. Guacamelee, which I played a decade ago, left neither a good nor bad impression with its connected map. Um, Dishonored did a good job at making player freedom invisible, since when I was playing, while I felt like I was doing everything the right and only way, there were apparently many, many micro choices that could lead to very different experiences built into the map. The, why do we let the player uh, exfiltrate the map? Because the player is deciding when their experience is over. The player is choosing to complete their objectives in that moment, but they might not be finished with the map. They might want to go check out this thing. You know, we, we make the maps filled with secrets and content. So that's a pretty well-built map that those features are invisible. The Batman Arkham games did a good job with all their maps. I replayed them all recently, and it gets better with every game. It feels like both a progression of your Batman abilities and the world you can use them in. Um, Slime Rancher maps got pretty complex and felt like a grind, but they were relatively well built. Uh, Piku... Piku Niku, I believe, Piku Niku had an alright map. It was pretty difficult to explore though, because you constantly had to solve puzzles to carry on, but I think there was minimal backtracking. I'm a bit foggy on it. Anyway, I don't have many more examples of maps, nor much to say on them, so I'll stop here. Please let me know your thoughts on gaming's expansion into space. I personally think it's a pointless, money-saving, content-stretching of normal, cohesive maps. But is it a step in the right direction to try to make planets or just larger separate areas in a game? I know that Batman Arkham Knight had different zones of the city, and Slime Rancher had different zones of the range, and Omori had different zones, but these zones were all also connected, and while I think it matters that they're connected, do you?